Hi, this is Mike Bloom. Thanks for checking out our sermon today. I pray that this message blesses you and gives you greater victory in your everyday walk in the kingdom of God here and now. God bless you richly. Dismantling the errors of Babylon's religious bondage. And you'll see how there's much thanks we can give to the Lord as we carry on in this message. But notice, how many know that in the Old Testament there was physical wars, there was swords, there was spears and shields and armies. But we don't fight a spiritual, or rather a physical war now. There's, there's, you've got Babylon in the Old Testament, you've got Jerusalem and Israel, and you've got all of these nations, and there was often some agitation and all of that going on. And in the New Testament, there's also a spiritual Babylon. There, there's... A spiritual Jerusalem. How many ever read about the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation? And, uh, and as these verses by Paul the Apostle state, we're still in a warfare. It's not a warfare of guns and you know, swords and spears, but it's a warfare in our minds. And well, look at what Paul said. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. Everybody say War. war. We do not war after the flesh. Now, you've heard about holy wars going on through history, uh, Christians and Muslims in the dark ages and all of that. God is not behind a holy war. Since the time of the cross, please note that. God is not behind those things. He says we don't war after the flesh. Now, this is not what it's about. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not material, they're not physical, but nevertheless they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But look what it says we're casting down. We're not casting down towers and castles and walls. We're casting down imaginations. Everybody say imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. An imagination affects your knowledge, it affects your mind. And there are things that need to be cast down out of our minds that are exalting against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Somebody say, it's not people we're captivating, it's thoughts. We're bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so... Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us with His Word today. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray You speak to all of us. We have given You thanks. Yes. Lord, we've laughed, we've cried already. And Lord, we've just given You glory. And, and we appreciate so much the words that every person that has spoken did speak. And we pray in Jesus' name that You'd continue to touch our hearts with this Word. And Lord, help us know the reality of what Paul, your apostle, was saying. That every thought can be brought into captivity to you, Lord. And in Jesus' name, we believe you for it, God. Amen and amen. amen. How many have ever had thoughts in your minds that you wish weren't there and you didn't want them there? You ever heard that saying, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest in your hair? <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to stop that from happening. <laughs> and... and you know what I mean? A thought comes in your mind, you dwell on it, and so forth. Real Christianity is going to affect you in your everyday life. It's not going to be a weekend thing where you talk about the Lord on Sunday and you say amen in prayer, never open the Bible again the rest of the week, never bow your knee and pray, and never really see things practically changed at work, at home, or wherever you are. Real Christianity, and this is what's happened in the revivals. I remember my uncles. I've got five uncles in the ministry. My grandfather was a drunk of the town, and, and people didn't want him in their homes. And one day he bowed his knee at a little church, and the Lord miraculously took alcoholism away from him in a split second. He was so changed it rocked that little harbor in eastern Canada in New Brunswick. Five preachers came out of that family of 19 kids. <laughs> and uh, I always thought it was weird I have an uncle a year younger than me. <laughs> that was quite a family. He's one of those preachers. But they say in Back Bay, New Brunswick, a revival hit that little town. 
This was nearby Black's Harbor where my grandfather come into the church. And, but in Back Bay, the revival hit that place back in, I don't know, it was the 60s or 50s, somewhere back there, that so many people were miraculously delivered from smoking. The, 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 the tobacco was drying up on the store shelves. They couldn't sell it anymore. And you'd go into the woods and you'd hear some of the, far, some of the woodsmen praising God in the middle of the afternoon out in the forest. And a revival affects you every day. And this is exactly what the Bible is intended to do. You see, when religion gets away from that, and it's just a weekend deal, or yes, I believe in the Lord, but you'll never know it by the way I live. <laughs> We've lost something. And all through history, there's been revivals that would spurt and grow. And you know, Canada has never really had a nationwide revival yet. It's not really happened yet. I mean a nationwide thing. Wales has had their revival. The United States has had the New England revival. And it's our turn. And who knows? I mean, it started in little things like this. We don't know what God will do. But what I'm talking about is there's a Babylon today and, and there's something that needs to affect us every day. There's not a carnal warfare going on with what's going on behind the scenes, but it's a spiritual warfare. And the foremost enemy of the people of Israel in the Old Testament times was named Babylon. It was like Satan's headquarters. Babylon's name means confusion. And do you remember when God confused the languages of the people at the Tower of Babel? That's where it got its name from, confusion of the tongues or the languages. So it would stop because God said they've set their hearts to this and when they get in unity like this, nothing will be restrained from them no matter how evil it is. And astrology, the horoscopes came from all of that time, witchcraft and all of that came from Babylon. And it, it amuses me, well, it doesn't amuse me, it saddens me that Christians will read the horoscope. And you know the Bible actually speaks about those things? Yeah. It talks about astrologers and witchcraft. It names it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, But Babylon set out to make itself great, and the people set out to make themselves a name. And, and it came into confusion. Now, the interesting thing is that God's city was Jerusalem, and that means the city of peace. And the enemy's city, Babylon, means confusion. Confusion is the opposite of peace. And so, spiritually speaking, I remember going through hard times in my Christian life where confusion was getting a hold of me. And I wanted peace. How many ever felt like that? You wanted peace. And in 2013, it's so much more like that. And confusion or Babylon is the opposite of Jerusalem and peace. And, and not only that, but confusion is an enemy of truth. Because look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and 33 when he mentioned confusion. He mentioned peace being the opposite of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Say Babylon. Babylon. But of peace. Say Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Isn't that wonderful? In all churches of the saints, God wants peace. And, and if there's one thing that really strikes you when you see somebody that gets a hold of the Lord, it's peace comes into their heart. Such peace. And, and hard times can be going all around, but you've got a peace in the middle of a storm. Amen. And so, so Paul is talking about this, and, and he also talks about this warfare we're involved with. There's still a Babylon that we're fighting. There's still a Jerusalem that's fighting this Babylon. But it's a new Jerusalem. And it's a spiritual Babylon. It's confusion. How many know the proverb says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so there's where the battle's going on right here. How many times have we been confused? We felt bound. And we're supposed to be victorious and happy people. We're supposed to be... And you know, the Bible actually teaches us how we can have that. And that's kind of what I want to help us with today. But when we're trying, we want to have that place. The flesh, our own humanity gets the best of us. And here is what God needs to accomplish. And this is what He wants to. And I think this is what He's starting to do now. There's men of God, women of God, all over the world that are starting to see some of this. And it's exciting me. Because God sees a need to dismantle 
false religious thinking in our minds and re-educate us with what the Word of God teaches so you actually can have peace when everybody around you can't understand how you could have it with maybe what you've been going through. Can you imagine having a peace when naturally speaking you would be going out of your mind? But miraculously, there's a peace of God on you. Real Christianity will bring us to this point. This is what I want to preach. I used to think of, I mean, I like this stuff in the Bible. Or I like that. I like the supernatural. How many believe God heals? He performs wonders. I've, I've seen people personally that I prayed for absolutely healed of bone cancer. I saw a woman's organs start coming to life again when the doctor said her neurological functions are shutting down. And, and I never saw so many tubes hooked up to a body in my life. And while doctors were milling around, myself were, we, and the family, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And then the woman started coming back to consciousness right in front of the doctor's eyes. Went and prayed for another woman. Or actually, it was the same woman. She started relapsing and, and lost her sight. She had, she, she had a baby. And, and she lost the baby and toxemia attacked her body. And I thought she was quite a large woman. Come to find out she was so bloated from toxemia that it was just her affliction that had attacked her because she was a slim woman. And then the, we get called into the hospital the next day. She's relapsing. She's gone blind. And a pastor from Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and myself from Dartmouth, we went to that hospital and we prayed. And while we were praying, the doctor came in. Her eyes are sights back again. And I love that. But you know, there's something far more important than any of that. You know, you, you can, there's ministries God has called that highlight those things. And I thank God for those ministries. But there's something we need more than the healing of a broken arm. We need our minds set free from confusion and bondage and, and, and condemnation and depression. And stress and things like this. Real Christianity, I'm going to show you these scriptures, are going to get right into the hearts of that kind of situation and, and see us help. And false religious idea doesn't help. You ever, you ever hear the teaching, well, you can never really get victory until you die and go to heaven. But try to get there as best you can because it's healthy. It'll keep you away from sin as best as you can get away from it. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> There's far more victory than that. That's right. There is. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 and 12, I actually ministered this in Winnipeg last Sunday afternoon, I will not be brought under the power of anything in this life. Nothing. Paul didn't have an addiction. He didn't have a temper. He didn't have a, a lust. It, those things were quashed in his life. And, and I want you to think of... of spiritual Jerusalem. How many know Jerusalem was a well-walled city? It was called the city of walls in the Old Testament. And I want you to think of it spiritually because Isaiah chapter 26 does this. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. Does anybody know what Judah means in English? Say praise. praise. Judah means praise. Now when you read the Old Testament you need to look at it spiritually for us today. Back then it was natural, but look at it spiritually. This shall be sung in the land of praise. When you're in a land of praise, spiritually speaking, you're in a land of victory and, and God is blessing you and you're strong in Christ. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, notice this, whose mind is stayed on thee. There we have a key right there. The people that are going to have perfect peace are the people whose minds are focused on the Lord. When you're at work, you make your mind focus on the Lord. When you're at home, when you're walking down the street, have a praise in your mouth. Your mind is focused. And God has given us a key. Your mind is stayed on the Lord to give you perfect peace. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. He brings down them that dwell on high, the lofty city. You think of 
Jerusalem when you think of peace. <coughs> what city do you think of when you think of the lofty city? Babylon. So spiritually speaking, Babylon is like... Uh, where, what, where did God bring Israel out of before he took them to the promised land? Egypt. Where did Egypt be, or rather Israel become bound in after they were in the promised land? It wasn't Egypt. It was Babylon. You see, when God saves a soul, spiritually he takes you out of Egypt. But after you're saved and you begin to have confusion and you get bound up in your Christianity, it's not Egypt you go into, it's Babylon. And so Babylon represents a threat to people already serving God. And this is what is happening today with so many people attending churches. The Bible says in the last days, ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. In other words, it's saying people are ever learning, they're ever going to church, they're ever hearing sermons, but they're never really coming to a power in their everyday life. It doesn't change the way they have to deal with problems. It doesn't change how they still get bound up and, and they have grudges against people. They can't look at them square in the eye and shake their hands because of something that happened between them. That is not right. And real Christianity solves those problems. Real Christianity affects the way you think. How many believers' minds wander into lustful thoughts that they should never wander into? And, and, and think things when they see people that they perhaps cry at night and say, Lord, I know this shouldn't be happening in my soul, but it is. I've got news that God is able to help us with these things. Where if you've got depression, bless God, let God wipe it out of your heart. And there's a key to helping that. I've gone through it. I know what I'm talking about. To see God give you victory over these things. But here's the key. It all begins in the mind. And so spiritually speaking, there is a Babylon that we're still dealing with. It's a lofty city. But God says, I have power to lay it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. And so bringing down this lofty city, first of all, we need this truth. Like it, you heard it this morning, but this afternoon... <laughs> this evening <laughs> but Carla I, I actually mentioned this so called book of the Bible called the book of Enoch that's not in our Bible the very night before she was watching the television show and happened to mention the book of Enoch and she said what is it I gotta ask Pastor Mike about this book I didn't know what she'd watched and here I bring it out right in the middle of my sermon that this book of Enoch is such and such don't pay attention to it it's not in the word of God and, well you don't have to ask Pastor Mike now but there's so many questions, so much thing going out there that we really need God to come on the scene. Now, when something like that happens, she said to me, oh boy, you just know God's talking to us when things like that happen. How many are glad he sees us? Yes. He knows every little thing you're going through. And so I wouldn't be the least surprised if there's people that are here right now that have been struggling with some things in your heart and you feel condemned you wonder how God could care for you after he's seen the thoughts that he's seen. How many know he sees our thoughts? And you are almost in a hopeless state. Of, how can I ever get victory over this? I'm going to church. What else can I do? I'm going to show you what to do. As we start focusing our mind, okay, I'm going to spend more of my mind on the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get more important, more concerned with the things in the Bible. Like There's lots in the Bible, but I need to focus on the real things that are going to help me every day, that are going to bring me peace. And this is what God has shown us. Remember the last few weeks we've been mentioning this. Our church has been given the uh, mandate to teach believers how to have victory over your own flesh, your own uh, tempers, impatience, whatever it is, over demons. I've cast demons out of people. One woman phoned me up from Winnipeg. She said, Pastor, I hear you've been involved in the deliverance ministry. Where is this happening anymore? And I said, I don't know of many places. It was actually one quarter of Jesus' ministry. But it's rare today. 
And, and yet we've seen it. We were with Bridget and Mike and Brandon and God was setting people free from demon spirits right in those meetings. And, and uh, she said, oh, there's a young man I need you to pray for in Winnipeg. And it was sad that she couldn't find a place in the city. And, and thank God, though, that she directs us. And she said, I don't even know how I come across your name, but thank you so much. And let's get together. So we're going to pray for this man. Keep us in prayer for that. But God wants to set us free, and His Word has the answer. There's battles that are going to occur. And we're not worrying after the flesh, though. In other words, it's not a material battle. How many know we're not fighting people? You ever see Christians fight other Christians? <laughs> Man, I remember back in the 80s, I won't mention the names, but one evangelist on the team was fighting another evangelist, and they were going to head-to-head -head each other, and then they were both caught in sin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, what is go what's the world think of this stuff? <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I didn't join in the fight and put them down. I prayed for them. I had a man knock on my door from one of these little cult religions. How many ever had them knock on your door? <laughs> and, and he was making fun and naming this guy, and tears came to my eyes, and he didn't know what to think when I said, you ought to be praying for that man. He's a soul of flesh and blood, just like you and I. And God wants to save him as much as anybody. Why are you kicking him down when he's already down? These are the last things that should be going on in the church. And so lies and false religious thoughts bring so many people into bondage. And you see, Babylon is a religious thing. It's so religious. And it brings you into a religious bondage. And God wants the ministries of this church world to dismantle those thoughts in your mind and show you the truth instead. To pick apart, detailingly show you what it is in your thinking that's bringing you into captivity. And, and then show you the step-by-step -step comprehensive steps of how the Bible teaches to get some victory in your life. To actually see depression go away. To real, I'm telling you, the kingdom of God is a powerful thing. If you've got condemnation in your heart, you can't work in this kingdom. This kingdom doesn't allow condemnation. You have to know who you are. And how many know God is really opening this up too? We were seated with Jesus Christ at the right hand throne in heavenly places when He saved us. Now I'm emphasizing this because that truth is going to come more alive in the years to come until Jesus comes where you're going to see dynamite people rise up for God that know who they are. And any lie of you're no good or you're not this isn't going to be accepted by these people's minds. You ever read the, the armor of God in Ephesians 6 where it talks about a helmet of what? So a helmet of salvation. What's a helmet for? It protects your head. So when you have a helmet of salvation, that means there's something about salvation that's going to protect your mind. And when you know Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, ascended up into heaven, sat on the throne of glory, and we were raised up with Him. When you know that, when you know that's what salvation has done for you, your mind is all of a sudden protected like you could never be protected by anything else. You know who you are in Christ. You know what the Bible says God did for you. We spoke again in Ephesians 1. Paul said, I need to pray for you, Ephesian Christians. He said, I'm praying for you that you get a spirit of wisdom and revelation. That you really know the power that God has for you. And then he says, here's the power God has for you. He raised up Christ from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places over everything, and that is the degree of power over you. Now what enemy is there next to death? Death is the last enemy that's ever going to be destroyed. And if God raised Christ from the dead, that enemy was snuffed out as easily as that. And how many know that happened 2,000 years ago? He conquered death. Yeah. Somebody say, he conquered death. Yeah. It's the greatest enemy we'll ever have, and Jesus conquered it. In fact, we can stand at a funeral of a believer and say, grave, where's your victory? Yeah. We can look that headstone right there. We could look at that hole in the ground, and we say, grave, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? 
Because this mortality is going to put on immortality one day. And this corruptible is going to put on incorruption. And then she'll be brought to pass that is saying, death is swallowed up in victory. And if that God that raised Jesus from the dead and conquered death has also got that power toward us, now you'll never be condemned again, no matter what lie came to your mind. And when you can face life's struggles thinking that way, I used to hear an old song when I was a teenager when I first got saved. Look out, Satan, look out. <laughs> Woo, somebody clap unto the Lord. And so what God is doing in this church in these days is really bringing out the apostles' teachings. And he's using the apostles' truths to rip them out of a spiritual Babylon and bring them back into a spiritual Jerusalem. I mean, look in the news. Is natural Jerusalem the city of peace that it's supposed to be named after? I mean, I, I don't know of a city on earth that has more wars. And the, uh, ironically, that's the city of peace, Jerusalem. There's a new Jerusalem yes. that the New Testament talks about. You come out of Egypt when you first get saved, but Babylon becomes a threat to you after you're already saved because it's Babylon that the people of Israel went into bondage in. And one of the great ministries coming to the forefront, as I said, is our position in Christ at the right hand throne. Somebody say at Zion. You see this Psalm 110 verses 1 and 2? That Psalm, those words on your screen, they are quoted more in the New Testament than anything else from the Old. Right there. And be honest with you, I haven't heard much preaching on it through the years. But it's getting back to the way it was in the book of the New Testament church. The New Testament writers, Paul wrote about it. Mark even put it at the end of his gospel. Jesus went up to the right hand throne. The book of Revelation says the Lamb's going to the throne. It's everywhere in the New Testament. But it's like God's returning us to that knowledge that Paul and those apostles had. And that's why the victory that they had, the miracles that occurred were astounding. And everybody's been puzzled through the years. What's the key to Book of Acts miracles again? What's the key to that kind of miraculous ministry in the world? It, it's, it's getting back to what they knew. Getting back to what they preached. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Everybody say Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. How many know Christ is on the throne right now? And there's a lot of enemies in this world, but he's ruling in the midst of them all anyway. <coughs> Did you ever hear that Jesus is going to come back to be king? That's off key. He's already king. It doesn't say, rule, sit thou after I make your enemies your footstool. Once all your enemies are your footstool, then after that, sit down and rule. He said, no, rule in the midst of your enemies until I make them your footstool. He's already king. But you see, there's a religious idea that can get into our heads, and I've heard them actually preach this. I've heard it on television. I've, I've heard the CDs, and that Jesus isn't king yet, but he's going to be king one day. Yes, he is king. He's seated right now in the midst of his enemies. And this is what Ephesians 1 and 19 says. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to who? Somebody say us. us. Us who what? Believe. Now what, how great is this power? According to the working of his mighty power. Now this is power that's toward us he's talking about. The power that we have, how great it is, is according to the power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That's how much power is toward us now. If you deal with your depression like that, depression wouldn't have a chance. Jesus is seated over all powers and that power that God put him there with is upon me? Willard Thiessen interviewed me on his television show and it was a door opening and I don't know if a door will ever open like that again. But God put a word in my mouth and I said it and I was so glad the way the editors did this with the interview because they took that one part and they made that a highlight at the beginning of the show. And it was this. 
Can you imagine us facing life situations knowing that the power God used to put Christ on the throne is on our lives now? Doesn't matter what it is, none of it can match the power of death and God used the power of, to put Christ over death and conquer it all. And that's the power upon us. Depression, you haven't got a chance. Stress, you can't take it. Amen. Patient, impatience, lust, no matter what it is, your own flesh, none of that can match the power of God that's on our lives now. But notice, I don't have it written here, but if you look to verse 18, you have to see it. You have to have your eyes open. Somebody say it with me. God, open the eyes of my heart. Say it again. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart. Let me see this. And that's why in the second chapter, after he says where God put Christ, he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's not only Jesus is up there. Spiritually speaking, I and you, we're sitting there right now. Amen. Now, here's, what, here's the key. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you don't know that, you're not going to enjoy that. But it could be true all this time. You don't know it, but it's true of you. Because the way you think, if you think you're defeated, you're going to be defeated. If you think you're condemned, you're going to be condemned. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what we need to do is take words like I've just read to you from Ephesians 2 and 6, from Ephesians 1, 19 to 20, and show you how in Psalms 110, look where Jesus is, and look in Ephesians where Paul says, God put you there with him. And what's happening is we're dismantling this condemnation out of your mind. We're dismantling this depression and we're taking it apart. It's a false religious thinking that, oh, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. Let me, let me give you a little shocker. We are not sinners when we are Christians. We are not. Somebody said, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, you were a sinner. You were saved by grace. But you'll never find the Bible say to the sinners, which are at the church of Ephesus, I write. Or to the sinners at the church of Rome. He says to the saints. And wait a minute. You might say, wait a minute. You have to perform four miracles and you've got to be dead before you can be called a saint. <laughs> now let me just dismantle that little religious thought out of your mind. That's from Babylon. That little sucker's from Babylon. <laughs> you are a saint because you're, all believers are called to be saints. How many know what the definition of a saint it's not sinner saved by grace. <laughs> it's a sanctified one. A sanct Somebody say, I am a sanctified one. Praise God. That sounds a lot better than I'm a sinner saved by grace, doesn't it? And that's what the Bible says we are, but you won't find these statements. Where is it? We're sinner you won't find that in the Bible. There's all these little things that might sound insignificant. It sounds kind of humility, humble and, and religious. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But unfortunately, it's not Bible. <laughs> Before we die and go to heaven, right here where we have enemies, we can rule in the midst of our enemies. How many read where Jesus was told, rule thou in the midst of your enemies? But no, for us Christians, get kicked around in the midst of your enemies. <laughs> no, we're seated with him. And Paul said, I will not be brought under the power of anything. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? And the Hebrews chapter 13 says, if he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, what, what should I fear? What shall I fear? What can man do against me if he said he'll never leave me nor forsake me? I'm telling you, if we really believe those things, if we get them into our hearts all the more and more as these days go on, we would be facing problems a lot different than what we have been. And look at this now. Oh boy, I'm excited about Isaiah 2. <laughs> Judah means praise. Jerusalem means peace. Everybody understand that? Look it up. Get a Hebrew dictionary. You'll find them right. Judah means praise. Hebrew, Jerusalem means peace. Now, read this. Isaiah 2. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Concerning praise and peace. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house 
shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, where is Christ seated at the right hand? In Zion. Somebody say Zion. Zion. Mm -hmm. Don't miss this. Little dog tried to steal that away from me just now. <laughs> right when I'm gone to get the most important point. Don't miss this. God bless, was it Sheba? What's the name again? <laughs> Simba. Out of Zion, he says, the this is where Jesus was said to be seated at the right hand. Zion. And, oh, i got to show you another verse in a minute. But it says, out of Zion is going to go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. How many have ever read John the Apostle in 1 John say, walk in the light as he is in the light. What's that mean? Come and let's walk in the light of the Lord, Isaiah prophesied. John says, here's what that means. In God is no darkness at all. In Him is no darkness at all. 1 John 5 and 7. Chapter 1, rather, verse 5. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, how many know in Him He's got no darkness at all? If you walk in the light like He is, there's no darkness. We have fellowship one with another. We and Jesus, we've got some fellowship happening. Yeah. And the blood of Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. A power comes on you that sets you free from depression. A power comes on you that sets you free from condemnation. And those lusts that are in your mind. The temper that flares up where you tear people's backs off of them. A, a, an anointing comes on and sets you free from those things. And there's one thing that has blessed me so much. Is after seeing people receive the word. People start commenting. I'm seeing lives change. We had a woman in New Brunswick start, or rather Winnipeg, start coming to our meetings because she distinctly couldn't believe the change that was happening with people who used to be so miserable with others, but started changing right before her eyes. Now that is what I'm talking about, about Christianity. Yes. I'm not talking about this where you go to church day in and day out, week in and year after year, and never get victory over your everyday situation. I'm talking about a power of God that fit, changes us so much where people start coming to the house of the Lord. And notice in Isaiah, he said, let's come to the house of the Lord. Let's walk in the light of the Lord. Let's go to this place called Zion. Because out of Zion, a law is going to... There's going to be people come out of that kind of Christianity that are going to live it every day. This isn't a legalistic law. This is a law in the sense that it's the way you live every day. It's the principles you live by that shine such a glorious light to people that are bound up. I went to church for years, but I never had the joy like those folks have. I went to Vic church for years, and I couldn't get over grudges. That I, but these people, I know they had grudges. I know the friends that they had. I know what they went. And I see such a drastic change. Oh, my. Hold me back. This, to me, is gold. When, and, and I've heard it. Some of you might not have even know, known this. But I've heard about people sitting right here that others have seen this kind of change happening. And that blesses me so much. Thank you, God. You see, in Hebrews 12 and 22, speaking of Zion, you are coming to Mount Zion. It's not talking about something we're going to. We've already come, according to what the writer of Hebrews says. Not only that, we are come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And you see, there's a religious idea. Oh, Jerusalem's on its way. It's not here yet. It's scientists say there's a cube in the sky coming. I found out that some of those things were hoaxes. You ever hear that thing where scientists actually see a cube in the sky come to... That is not true. I've heard it said over pulpits, but I, I researched it. It's not true. The Bible says we're already come to heavenly Jerusalem. Let that one sink in for a second. 
Well, I was told. <laughs> I'm just telling you what Hebrew says. Somebody said, we're already come. We're at Zion. We're at the new Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. And oh, praise God. And now, I want to end this message. I've got a lot more I don't have time for. But remember Isaiah said, they shall turn their weapons into pruning hooks, their spears into plowshares. There's a warfare that's going to go on with weapons. And then after the warfare has gone on with the dismantling and the warfare in our mind, I'm going to tell you how that warfare works in just a sec. God is going to take those same weapons and turn it into farming instruments because we're going to have such a harvest of souls come in. A pruning hook, a plowshare is meant to bring a harvest in. And there is going to be weaponry turned into farming tools for a harvest and a thanksgiving that this world never can recognize. And it's happening. Gerald said it's been an absolute record of the material harvest this year when everybody was scared out of their wits for the rains and the waters and the floods in the spring. And by the same token, just when your life seems it's going through hard and the floods are coming in. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible says, I'll raise up a standard against it and there will be a greater harvest than you've ever dreamed. Why a great record harvest now materially in the, the biggest threats we've been having in the last few years? Because it's a reflection in the Spirit because this is exactly what God's going to do in the Spirit. And look at this. You want to know who the weapons are? In Jeremiah 51, Thou, everybody say me. me. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. You are the weapons God's going to use. He's going to use you. Right. You're going to tear down things. Look what it says you're going to do. For with thee I will break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. And I want you to translate all those worldly kingdoms in the Old Testament to demonic kingdoms in the New. We're going to destroy demonic strongholds in people's minds. With thee will I break in pieces the horse and his rider. With thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider. With thee I will break in pieces man and woman. With thee I will break in pieces old and young. And with thee I will break in pieces the young man and the maid. I will also break in pieces with thee the shepherd his flock. With thee I will break the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. I will break the captains and the rulers. I will render unto Babylon this religious deception that has made believers think they're nothing. Coming into church, going away more discouraged than when they came. Beaten down with, you're not this and you're not that. I remember hearing years ago when I first got saved, church, we're not praying enough. And man, I never felt like praying after that sermon. <laughs> I was having a struggle with prayer, but after that sermon, I hardly pray at all. I didn't need to be told what I've got to struggle with. I need to be told how to get victory over it. And praise God, I'll render Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they've done in Zion, in your sight. You see, in Zion, this is Jerusalem where God's people were. And Babylon, these religious things have taken away. Oh, Lindsay, you might as well preach my sermon when you get up. <laughs> it just hit me between my eyes now. The Bible was read. The Bible was studied, but miserable, miserable, miserable. And it got worse and worse, and things were twisted out of its proper perspective. But he says, I'm going to destroy that. And I'm against the old destroying mountain, says the Lord, which destroys all the earth. I will stretch out my hand upon thee, roll thee down from the rocks, and make thee a burnt mountain. And here, well, you've got Babylon brought down. In fact, if you read Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, Babylon, Babylon has fallen. Revelation 14 and 8 is fallen and standing on Zion is the Lamb with 144,000 with the Father's name written on their foreheads. Right after you read of the mark of the beast on people's foreheads, there's hundreds of thousands with the Father's name on their foreheads. And somebody says the mark of the beast is a computer chip. My God. How ridiculous can you get? Church, it's a thing in your mind. It's your will being affected by the enemy. And I want the Father's name on my forehead. Amen. And raised up and see a spiritual Babylon made to a burnt mountain. And in closing, Daniel was in Babylon. And if you've got an iPad or an iPhone, you've got all these scriptures, you're going to be able to read right now. 
but Bab Babylon was where Daniel lived. They say he was between 13 and 16 years old when he went. And his three friends went with him, taken out of Zion. It says there's Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Have you ever heard of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah before? How many heard of them before? How many heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That's what Babylon gave the names for these three Hebrew boys. And Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah went into a fiery furnace. And the king of Babylon fell on his face and praised the God of Israel. Daniel went into a den of lions. And Darius, the third king. You see, Daniel had been in that wicked kingdom 65 years from the time he was a teenager. And when they were brought there, Babylon tried to teach it teach them all its ways. But the Bible says God gave them understanding. They didn't accept the teachings of Babylon. They got the words of God in their mind. And God raised them up in the middle of Satan's headquarters and brought the king to his knees before God. And Darius says, let Daniel's God be the God that all Babylon worships. And through four successive kings, through two successive kingdoms, Babylon and Medo-Persia, Daniel, well into his 60s and 70s and 80s, was standing strong for God and bringing a kingdom to its knees. And church, this is what we're going to see before God takes us out of this world. You're going to see such people with such victory. No, and Daniel didn't even have the New Testament Holy Spirit like we do now. And the Bible says, make disciples of nations. Can you imagine, instead of like a city or a crowd becoming disciples, an entire nation comes to God? And I saw a video. How many saw the video of transformations? Did you see the one where in, um, where was Idi Amin, dictator over? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Is it Ghana? Uganda. Uganda where the leader of Uganda had a stadium rented and repented before God on behalf of her whole nation for the idol worship and the false gods that they used to worship. And I remember as a kid the days of Idi Amin in the 70s. He actually was a cannibal and he ruled Uganda with an iron fist. We were sending, trying to send food over to help them there, and they were rotting and drying up in the docks. But here a nation came down on its knees before God. Oh, hallelujah, God. Folks, God wants to give us this kind of victory every day of our lives. Bring us, and you, you, you see, we're not only going to have a Thanksgiving of harvest of fruit of souls, but when God is able to take the anger out of your heart, when He's able to take the lust out of your heart, the temper, the jealousy, mm -hmm. the lustfulness, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such as now. There's going to be a thanksgiving harvest of such fruit of the Spirit in your heart. The world will stand in awe watching your life. How many want a thanksgiving like that? Oh, God. It's from the harvest of the crops, Gerald, isn't it, this thanksgiving comes from? We give thanks at the harvest time in autumn. We're going to have some of that in our bellies this afternoon. But Look, if we could have a fruit of the Spirit harvest and give a thanksgiving that will last on into eternity. Oh my, let's all stand together. Thank you. <laughs>